Christopher Nolan is someone who needs no introduction. But I'll do one anyways. The British filmmaker is one of the greatest technical auteurs of all time. His dedication to the medium has created some of the best films in the past 20 or so years. This includes a genre-defining action thrillers like Inception and The Dark Knight, sci-fi spectacles in Tenet and Interstellar, and his staple mind-bending mysteries in Following, The Prestige, and of course Memento, the film that jump-started his career. With such a polished filmography with no big blotches throughout the past two decades, there has to be some kind of secret sauce to making massive box office hits while also being critically acclaimed. So having gone through a quick refresh on his 1500 minute filmography, at least before the release of Oppenheimer, I've gathered some of Nolan's defining strengths, weaknesses, techniques, and quirks as a filmmaker, some of which are the most obvious and others that are pretty unique. But all of these are what make his films what they are, for better or for worse. This is how to make a Christopher Nolan movie. Earlier, I mentioned that Nolan is one of the greatest technical auteurs of all time. He's up there with Stanley Kubrick, James Cameron, and David Fincher in that route. Where the differences lay is that they also masterly weave their technicals with their stories. See, Nolan's Achilles heel and main criticism for the past decade of his filmography has been his inability to make compelling characters. They tend to come off more as pieces on a chessboard of his grand narrative. It's why I'd classify Nolan as a bare metal filmmaker. He's someone that's able to give you a great system in every facet of your story, except for the heart of the story itself. And this all comes down to the screenplay. Christopher Nolan has penned all of the scripts he's made in the films, and I'd say that some of his weakest in terms of dialogue, character development, and continuity are ones that he's done by himself. Even if something like Inception is considered his best film, I'd think that almost everyone would agree that his writing is lacking at times. The crew in Inception feels a bit too robotic, no one leaves a lasting impression on me in both Dunkirk and Following, and he named the protagonist in Tenet, the protagonist. Again, they're used as chess pieces, not characters. And don't even get me started with the classic don't tell but show rule that every screenwriter learns in their first couple of lessons. I understand explaining some complex concepts, but there comes a point where it becomes an expository mess, and I feel like that happens a lot. With all this in mind, there has to be something the audience can bite on which involves both the characters and the story. And it's the way he structures his films. Take Inception for example, while yes it's very dialogue heavy in its first hour, the way the film is presented from there on out is a strong exercise in controlling your characters. There are three main plot threads going on throughout the second act, representing the three different levels of Fisher's dream. The further we progress through these levels of the dream, the less we see from the level before it. This creates a very interesting dynamic as the less we see from one level, it creates an illusion that slows that said level down both literally and mentally. As we perceive that when we cut from one level to another, the action stops, even if it doesn't. It then climaxes when the cuts between the levels become much shorter, the action becomes even more intense than before, and the synchronization is seconds away, depending on which level we're talking about. What about the structure in terms of his characters? Well, there's actually a very noticeable rhythm when it comes to how he handles them. Let's take a look at The Dark Knight. Hailed as the greatest comic book movie of all time, it has some of his best character work. A large portion of that is because of Heath Ledger's iconic Oscar-winning performance, but the basis of his and other characters' development is on what I'd like to call the Christopher Nolan Triangle. In almost every film of his, there is a relationship triangle created between his main pieces on the board, and this usually represents a central theme within the story. For The Dark Knight, the triangle would consist of Harvey Dent, the Joker, and Batman, representing Gotham's light, dark, and of course the very grey area Batman lives in. For The Prestige, the triangle would consist of Borden, Cutter, and Angier, representing the mastery, balance, and obsession with the art of illusion. And finally, for Memento, its triangle would consist of Leonard, Natalie, and Teddy, where Natalie and Teddy represent deception and honesty, against Leonard's skewed perceptions in the middle. 
This little technique creates a nice way to develop your characters, as each point in the triangle can influence each other, whether through conflict, partnership, or conflict in partnership. And similar to my commentary on Inception, it creates a very impactful sequence to help outweigh the lack of it in terms of dialogue, but they're nowhere near to the point where it makes it the main reason you watch his films. The main reason you watch his movies is because of one thing. Spectacle. The past six films in his filmography are what I'd like to call spectacle-fused cinema, focusing on abstract and grand ideas with massive set pieces to support them. It's his staple to lean heavily on this framework as it presents his characters, worlds, and stories as being larger than life. And that's thanks to both Wally Pfister, who worked as his DP from Memento to The Dark Knight Rises, and Hoyt van Hoytma, who worked from Interstellar and onwards. Both obviously have their own caveats going for them. Pfister leans more on traditional styles and naturalistic looks to give richer visuals, and van Hoytma leans more on innovative and surrealist visuals, bending the use of color and light at his will. Add on the fact that Nolan has always wanted his films to use practical effects whenever possible, they feel consistent in balancing the fine line between the real and the abstract. And what better way to shoot these grandiose films than in IMAX? Nolan has always been a champion of the use of such cameras. He was even the first major Hollywood director to use them in 2008's The Dark Knight. And from then on, he'd start to heavily shoot his films in IMAX. Even with it being laughably massive and heavy to operate, he still uses them, doing the absolute extremes just for it to work. We started to invent stuff to make it possible for us to put the camera on planes and in the cockpit, engineering special lenses that would put the lenses in certain places where it was impossible for a camera to be. But for how phenomenal it looks on screen, it's well known as to how problematic it is to have it go hand in hand with the audio department because they are incredibly loud. It's become a bit of a problem for Nolan, especially in Tenet, where audiences have been very critical of the film's audio mixing. Whether on purpose or not, and through interviews it most certainly is, the use of IMAX cameras certainly doesn't help whenever dialogue is actually necessary to the story. Especially for someone that relies heavily on exposition, as Nolan often does. But it's not the only thing that noticeably echoes throughout his career. For as iconic as his sweeping establishing and long shots are, they're not nearly as memorable as the scores that supplement them. And Nolan has worked with a variety of composers throughout his career, but his absolute number one guy has to be the two-time Oscar winner Hans Zimmer. Through their numerous collaborations, they've been able to develop a very strong director-composer relationship. And it's to the point where Nolan could just let him explore the sounds of music. What I wrote for Hans to get him started was some dialogue that, that I'd written for the film mixed with some ideas behind the film without any indications as to genre or scale, just to free him up from that. And to support his bare metal filmmaking, ever since Memento, he's always intended to lean on musicians who have a heavily influence on electronic music through a minimalistic voice with an atmospheric canvas. But even with different composers throughout his career, the scores of his movies all seem to have a similar rhythm to them, a basis in their DNA that make them sound like a Christopher Nolan movie. And it's this. For as grand and far-reaching as Nolan's films are, it's the smaller aspects that make his scores and films what they are. I'm talking about space and yeah. huge and epic and all this, and then finally I'm going, stop, you know, <laughs> stop. Yeah. I've written this tiny, tiny little thing, you know, this really fragile, personal thing. And he goes, yeah, I know where the heart of the movie is now. It speaks volumes as it mirrors most of Nolan's films, and as gigantic or cold as they're portrayed, their cores are intended to be held much closer to the chest. And that right there is what makes Nolan's films what they are. <laughs> 
ever-expanding abstract ideas that lay a more intimate story through the lines of his scripts. And while he's gotten mixed results in his characterization, the intricate structure of his narratives and technical prowess tend to overcome his glaring weaknesses as a writer and help captivate the audience through his mind-bending stories. His dedication to the progression of the medium with his grandeur spectacles and auditory journeys is truly what makes him the filmmaker that he is today.